So if you're new to Vow Disciple or been playing it for a while, but are stuck on some of the finer points and some of the guides out there are a little outdated, this guide is going to help you understand how to do the raid based on lots of Sherpa and run throughs. It's gonna be updated and it's gonna to get to the point and tell you exactly what you need to do to be successful with any group. First off, I'm not gonna do the first encounter because again, if you've done the mission within the Witch Queen, the, the weekly mission, you know how to do this at this point. So I'm gonna skip through that. The first real encounter is the acquisition encounter. And again, many of the things you're gonna learn in here, you're gonna need throughout the raid. First off, we'll go ahead and get over the thing that's gonna trip up a lot of people up and that's all the symbols. Now, the good news is for this first encounter, you're only gonna to have to learn half of the symbols that are used throughout the raid. So it's a good refresher, but again, Go ahead and make sure you know those symbols and agree with your fire team. Everyone's going to call them something different. I'm going to put some infographics that will show names, but not everyone uses those names. Again, just make sure your fire team agrees with what the names are of the symbols. And in general, even if you jo join an LFG group and you don't know exactly what they are, you can generally figure out from what most people, unless they're crazy, call this on how these particular symbols are and how they work. When you're entering the room, you're going to notice that in the center, first off, on the right and left are dark and light areas. Dark is pyramid, light is for traveler. This will happen throughout the raid. In each of the areas is gonna be an obelisk and a totem. The totem is basically a area that looks like it has three plates that are standing upwards, but it's just three individual plates that'll line up over time. The obelisk is gonna have the same thing, but it's gonna be on three sides. So it's more like a, a pyramid, like a, a pyramid or triangle that goes up. The other thing you'll notice is a, scattered around the room, there are a bunch of doors. Those doors within them, on the top of them, have a symbol, okay? And I'll show in this map that these are areas you're gonna to have to enter based on symbols that you see later. In between each of these are taken knights that will show up and they also play a role in this encounter. Finally, in the middle, there's a nut that's in the middle that you can shoot to open the doors if they're closed. Each of those two teams, you're going to have a defender and a runner. Now, I will tell you, if you're in really good groups and you struggle with defending, you can only have like one or maybe two runners at any one time and still do this encounter. So again, once you get more comfortable with it, there are ways to compensate for weaker teams. One of the totems is going to light up with a darker light symbol. What that tells you is that a Taken Knight is either on the light side, the traveler side, or the dark side, the pyramid side. The people who are running typically, you can have defenders do it too, are gonna to look around and try to find those taken. Again, they're in specific places that are shown on that map that I showed earlier. Once you kill that on one of the totems, the next thing is gonna show up is a symbol. That symbol will show you which door you're gonna go through. Now, again, this is where you can have a runner each side. You can also have a runner just to the front and back of the room because they can cover most of the room otherwise. But one of the runners is going to then run into the door. If the door is closed for some reason, shoot the nut in the middle and that'll open it. Once the runner is in that room, then you're going to have another symbol show up, either light or dark on the totem. That will show you which of the glyph keepers to shoot in the room. You wanna shoot the correct one because that one will have the symbol that you're eventually gonna put in the obelisk. So after you do this the first time, after you actually take the first take a night and you go into the room, one of the other totems is gonna to start the same process. And again, it's to do the same thing. To first take out a knight, to then show a symbol to go in the room, to then show you which side glyph keeper you're gonna show to get the symbol. You're gonna do this for all, for three times basically, one for each defend point. When you do that, that's going to show you the three symbols that you're going to need to take the totem and advance the encounter. So while you're doing all that, the people who are defending are going to look at their totems during this process of defending. Some people, if you're on PC, can obviously type in the chat what the symbols are, or you can have one person memorize them. Only one totem is going to have all three of those symbols. They'll have a bunch of symbols, a total of nine symbols, but only one will have those combination. And then once you know that, you basically have to shoot those three symbols very quickly in a row, and that basically finishes the first phase of the encounter. While you're doing this, you're gonna have a bunch of ads show up. So again, that's primarily the defender's job. The other thing that will show up is unstoppable, so you need to be prepared to deal with that. So again, if you struggle with ad clear, if you're doing this on master, you only need so many runners. So that's one thing to keep in mind if you're trying to balance this out. 
The other thing that could help out here is if you're really struggling running like stasis, like running a warlock build or several warlock builds to freeze things, you can use strand. Again, anything to clear the ads out because as the ads are shooting the obelisks and totems, they will actually speed up the encounter and give you less time to complete each of the obelisks. And if they do, if the obelisks do get sped up and you don't get it in time, that will wipe the fire team. So once you do that once, once you go through that entire process the first time, then everything will reset, you'll start over and you'll do it a second time. The great news after this is once one obelisk is locked in, even though you'll still be reading symbols off of all of them, the obelisk that's the symbol for that second phase will be one of the two that are remaining. And then when you do for the third phase, it will be the only that last one. So again, that will allow you very quickly to know, okay, if it's the one close to the door you came in, you know it's the two in the back. Then on the second time, if it's one of those others, then you know which one's the third. And it makes it very easy to know which one you're supposed to be shooting. Do the obelisk three times. And at that point, you finish the encounter, get your chest. The caretaker encounter is similar to the Golgoroth encounter within King's Fall with a couple twists. So first off, you're gonna divide up into three groups of two, but it's a little bit different this time. There's gonna be this caretaker, which is similar character to Golgoroth in that you're going to need to exchange his gaze to keep him busy because he's trying to get up to your fire team and wipe your fire team and trying to prevent that. So have the first two people get near the caretaker and essentially what they're gonna do is they're gonna shoot him grab his gaze so he concentrates and then stun him. You stun him by one person having his gaze and the other person stun him in the back. This will stun him for a period of time. With a good group of people doing this, you can actually extend how long DPS goes on, but also give your runners, which we'll talk about in a minute, enough time to be able to do what they need to do. The next role, which you probably wanna do with two people, again, you could do more if you struggle for some reason, but the next role you're gonna have is your runners. And this is my favorite role. This is the role I like to do. So for the runners, they're going to, on each floor, they're, you're gonna notice, first off, you're gonna have one door at the beginning. What they're gonna do is, they're gonna take turns running into a room, which you open up with little nuts, and looking for symbols. As they're in that room looking for symbols, they're gonna notice that there's gonna be a pervading darkness buff that will eventually kill them. So they do have a time limit. They're gonna run in, they're going to look for three of the symbols and you're gonna to wanna to run through them. Now, again, if you get stuck for time, you can do less, but this is the most efficient way to do it. Run in, get the three symbols. The reason you wanna have one person on the outside is because that person is gonna shoot the nut to let you back out. As soon as you're coming out, you can call out the symbols and then you guys can divide up which ones you're shooting, right? Because there are gonna be three of the symbols that are gonna be on the obelisk. So time it together. Three, two, one, however you want to do it and shoot it. Now, depending on how good you are, you can actually call them out ahead of time. As soon as you can get out, the other person can actually shoot them all and then he can go back in. So once you're out, the other person is going to go back in because they're going to get the next three symbols. And the reason you're doing that is because you want to stay out and get that pervading darkness off of you. Because if that gets to times 10, it's going to blind you and it's going to kill you. So we're going to have the next person go in. They're going to do the same thing. Their job gets a little bit more complicated because there are less symbols. So they have to look a little further to get them. So they get their three symbols, they call them out, you or they go ahead and input them in, and then you have six of the nine put in at that point. Once you're done with that, the last person, if you've done three, again, if you're running out of time, you can do less than that, but keep in mind, as they're doing the stuns, that caretaker is working his way up the stairs. So for that last person goes in, it's actually pretty easy. You just pick up whatever the three ones in, and at that point, as you exit, okay, just have the person shoot them because you know the last three. Now, if you've taken less, you've done two at a time or something like that, that may not work, right? But that's, again, that's typically if you're running out of time, if you're trying to do this encounter and maybe you're, you know, have too many stacks. Like for instance, if you have more than like five stacks and go back in, you're gonna be really quick. If you're more of that, there's no way you're gonna have time to go get three symbols. Now, if you get all of those three symbols, right? If you get those three sets, do all nine, and do it in time, that's where you'll be able to do DPS here in a second. Now, the other two people, what they're basically doing at that point is ad cleared. Now, depending if you're playing as master or not master, you may have champions, you may have other things to deal with. Again, same thing as the first encounter. You can use things that are really good at ad control, right? Uh, Wither Horde works really well here, and you can even do that with the people that are potentially either stunning, and even for the runners, while they're sitting there waiting, they can help out with some of the ads, but also doing things like stasis, or strand can also help out in ad control. 
Now, if you've done a good job here, again, you're gonna slowly work the gatekeeper up because that's what the people who are doing the stuns are doing, right? You have kept the ads clear and you'll have the people finishing up with the running. Now, if you struggle with the running, you can have a third person run because it is possible so if you have three people running, that since you'll have two people out there, they can also help with ad clear. And then you have one person that's just primarily an ad clear. So again, just depends on what your, your, your fire team is struggling with. But the real key is having a really good set of stunners because if, you, if you're stunning the caretaker constantly, you will have a ton of time to make up and get the things you need to get done. At that point, what's gonna happen is the caretaker, whichever stair he's coming up, he's going to he's gonna end up at a plate, okay? That plate is where you'll first, he'll end up right near there is where you'll do damage. It'll light up. Once he does that, start doing damage for a little bit. And then at a certain point, you'll see the second plate light up. Go to the second plate, do the same thing, and then he'll go to the third plate. A couple tips when it comes to DPS is he is uh, gated. So one of the things we typically do is we do a lot of damage on the first plate. We'll do a little damage on the on the third on the second plate. And on the third plate, then we unload. And one of the reasons you want to do this is because then you potentially can get to two phasing him, right? Because otherwise it gets a little bit difficult because it's planned to be something that has three, so you're doing all the floor. Once you're done with this the first time, you're gonna notice that you have to go up the stairs and you have to go to the second floor. On the second floor, you're now gonna have two doors that the runners have to deal with. So that means a bigger area, a lot more jumping. There are more open areas where you can fall in the holes. So what that what, that's one thing to keep in mind. So when you're doing this, invisibility helps if you're trying to go through, because usually we just ignore the ads and we try to go around them. So the, again, invisible helps with that. Anything that will protect you will help out. If you're on a hunter having stompies on or having a, a class like a Titan or a Warlock that jumps better, probably helps out here too. Outside of that, the mechanics work exactly the same. If you don't kill him or get him to his final stand on the second floor, then you have to go to the third floor. Third floor gets a little more complicated. There are now three doors you have to deal with and a lot of vast jumping areas you have to go to get the symbols. So that's where your runners, again, your stunners are the key, but if you don't have good runners, it can be problematic. But again, if you have really good stunners, you could send a third person if your fire team is struggling with this. Again, on each floor, you do damage the exact same way. Whenever you get him to down to his smallest amount of damage, he'll have a final stand. Now, economy, ammo economy can be an issue in this encounter. That's why running double special is a really good idea. You might have, if you really struggle with this, you can have outbreak at the very beginning, at the very end. The main reason why is at the end, if you get him down to that last stand damage, you're gonna see stairs that come down. It doesn't matter what floor you're on, on first, second, or third, whatever, that's where it's gonna come down. And if you don't do it at the third, and he still has extra damage, you still have to get to the final stand, even if it's extra. You're gonna have three plates you proceed on to do damage to him. So keep that in mind. If you have far away stupors, things like that, try to conserve those to a little bit later on if you possibly can. But again, just start piling damage. And again, if you're struggling with economy of ammo for some reason, or if you don't have the supers that you need, then you're gonna to wanna to make sure you have outbreak or some sort of kinetic that does decent damage and Outbreak works well, because if you're doing it as a fire team, you do more damage, that will save you many times. Like I said, the biggest challenges with Caretaker are making sure you have really good stunners, you know, fairly decent runners, and then making sure you balance your, your ammo economy, because ammo, especially the end, becomes a real problem, kind of like Oryx in many respects, where you can run of ammo for that final stand, and that can wipe your fire team. So the third encounter exhibition is probably one of the most challenging encounters in the entire raid. Now, each of the encounters before can be challenging. The first encounter is probably challenging because you're learning the symbols and there's some coordination with that. The second one is just getting the timing of, of stunning the gatekeeper and again, symbols. The third room, where in other rooms you had to find jobs to stay the same way the entire time. This one, you're, you may, if you have a fire team that you know, have the same roles you know, match to match. But generally, people are going to, have to do different roles, which requires understanding how all the mechanics in the encounter work. First off, I'm going to talk about a couple of the roles and items that you can pick up in different rooms. So the first item is a take a nut or laser. This particular item you're going to use for taking down white shielded knights. Those knights, you'll notice you have a counter that counts down until you're going to die as a fire team. As it gets lower and as you do other mechanics, one of these knights will show up. They show up in specific locations on the map. Your primary job is you can use that laser to kill any enemies, 
but your primary job is when that knight comes up is to kill it. Killing it will extend its timer. One of the other roles is the Aegis from Vault of Glass. For this, you'll notice during the encounter you get a, a Pervading Darkness buff. The only way to take this off is to use this similar to how you do in the Vault of Glass and when the people are around to take and reset that buff. Since as we get to further parts of this encounter because there are different rooms and they get bigger, there are going to be fire teams that are splitting up into different areas. This is the person that's got to have the most mobility. They're going to repeatedly have to go from one side of the map to the other, helping people with this darkness as it continues to build. The final relic that you're going to have is a relic that it's kind of like the Eye of Riven. Again, they just stole these from different raids. This will allow you to take off Taken Blights. That will be shielding enemies you have to take down to advance the encounter. So a couple tips here. You will have to be mobile like the person of the Aegis. The good news is you're not reliant on where fire teams are to do this. You're reliant on fixed locations on the map. As the rooms get larger, you're typically going to have to go from one area of the map to the other. But again, the difference is you're not, the, you're not re relying on the fire team. You know where you're going every time. The other trick is in some of the rooms, depending on how your fire team does this, you may want to consider when you first come in, skipping the first blight that's closest to you and going the opposite directions. The blights will always spawn right, left, right, left, right, left. The first one, in many cases, you can skip that one initially and just keep going to the second one. So again, that's a tip that you can take. The other thing about any of the relics is at when you get to the end of the encounter, you will need to put the relics in two areas at the end of the encounter. The other thing is, if you have a relic, you have a timer where you can't pick up another relic for a period of time. So that's where people are gonna have to balance out alternating rooms picking up relics. If you happen to die with a relic, or if you drop a relic, that's a problem because you need the relics that you've picked up to at the end to put them in a location to actually advance the next room. If you happen to die, or if you happen to lose a relic, the only way around that is you or someone else has to go back to the beginning and pick up the relic from the area that you picked it up to begin with. The other thing the relics help with is being able to read the Glyph Keepers. There are Taken Glyph Keepers and there are Scorn Glyph Keepers. The Relic Holders can read the Glyphs from the Taken Glyph Keepers. Non-Relic Holders can read it from the Scorn uh, Glyph Keepers. That's why it's important as you're running through this encounter, especially in the bigger rooms, to have a Relic. So specifically for the person with the Taken, and the person with the Aegis, they're gonna constantly alternate so that you definitely, A, they're able to do their jobs on each side, but B, they're able to read the Taken Glyph Keepers. So the main point of this is you're gonna have a set, you're gonna have Glyph Keepers on each side of different types, right? Whether they're Scorn or Taken. And what you're gonna to wanna to do is people call out the three symbols they see, and this side calls out the three symbols they see. They match them up and whichever one is common, that's the first of the symbols they're gonna use. So let's pull this all together. In the first room, you're just going to have the nut that fires the laser. In this case, have your fire team split into in three groups, uh, two groups of three, go either side, kill their particular glyph keepers. There'll be a scorn and there'll be a taken. Remember that the relic holder can read the taken one. They'll read their three, their three things, right? Their symbols, find the common one. At the door, there'll be a little place to shoot, shoot the correct symbol that will open the door in between the two rooms you're going to deposit the laser when you do that then what you're going to see is that two relics show up one is a laser someone else picked that up and one is the aegis again because that's pervading darkness starts in that second room in this room you're going to want again have people split up into two groups of three right and decide how you guys want to do it every fire team is a little bit different on how they want to do this right but you're gonna wanna go through, kill all your Glyph Keepers, and just, again, just keep killing enemies. Read your three symbols on each side. You're gonna match one. That is, in this room, you actually need two symbols to shoot, right? For this one, you're gonna do that that first time. The room will reset. Resetting the room also is probably when you're gonna wanna kill that taken white knighted guy, right? You wanna kill him to give yourself some additional time. First room, you could have done that too. 
It's not as necessary because again, it's a really quick room. Do that and then again, rotate people around. Have the Aegis guy go to the other side, kill your Glyph Keepers, get the second symbol, go up and shoot it. One thing you keep in mind, starting here, when you go into the next room, you're gonna know Screeb are gonna be there in the area where you put your, your relics in. Watch out for them, they can mess up your run. Have everyone put their relics in at this point. And then you, at that point for this third room, you're actually going to get the taken, the basically the Eye of Riven from Last Wish. Again, this, as a reminder, this is what you use to take off the Blights who are blocking the enemies you need to kill to continue to advance. For this room, again, same deal, alternate. Everyone's gonna come, I'm not gonna go into strategy on which way to go because every fire team has a different way of doing it. I will say in this room, a lot of people will take, basically, when you show up, if, as you come out the door, if the taken blight is right there on the right, then that group with that relic will go to the left and deal with that first one first. And if it's on the left, they go to the right. So again, every fire team's kind of a different way. You'll kind of find out through trial and error with your team how you want to do that. So again, and some of the things that are tricky with this is sometimes it is a little buggy depending on the enemies you've killed on how long it takes for the enemies on that second area to kind of show up. So keep that in mind. One important trick I'm going to tell you right here that's really important is that as you're advancing at the very beginning, it gets tricky with trying to get the Aegises across, get the relics across, right? The timing. So one trick you can do, on the left side, there's a door. If you stand up against that door, I'll show it in this infographic, you actually will get the pervading buff to stay off of you. So that is really tricky, especially if you're trying challenges or master or try or try and do this on low man or something like that. That will help you out quite a bit. So again, some of the same concepts as before, right? Everyone's gonna go, the Aegis is gonna go back and forth. Typically in this room, what you're gonna do is once you start killing your initial adds, you will probably at that point, you've helped your fire team, the person with Aegis is gonna go all the way to the other side of the map. You can use the pillars in the middle to help you jump across if you're struggling. Same thing goes with the person with the taken Eye of Riven. They're gonna to wanna to alternate and go to the other area because there's probably a blight that's blocking them from advancing as well. Around this time where that switch happens, the White Knight is also gonna show up. He's gonna show up on one of the pillars near the exit door. Watch out for him. This is probably the trickiest part of this because killing that first knight is very critical because sometimes he comes up late depending on getting the Glyph Keepers down. If you don't do that in a timely fashion, he won't show up and then you'll wipe as a fire team. So the person with, the, with that particular relic needs to stay within visual contact of being able to do that no matter what else is going on. Once you finish that that first time, again, continue to alternate with the relics, continue to get your Glyph Keepers down. I, in this area, I would, because again, there's no boss in this in any of this encounter. I would go ahead, if you have to use your supers, this to me is probably the most difficult room. Just because there's some tricky jumps, you can't see the entire room. The fourth room, once you get to the end, you know, again, you've done this twice, very two symbols, shoot them on the wall, watch out for the screams, come in, deposit your relics. Now with depositing your relics, one of the big things too is make sure everyone is ready before you deposit your relics. Because once you start doing that, it starts a timer. So I would just kind of wait until everyone's there. Don't try to get ahead of yourself. The final room is very large, but I don't find it terribly difficult. Again, same sort of concept. I love on this one to use a hunter with stompies. It helps with the jumping. I tend to just use the middle platforms here to kind of get from one side of the room to the other. But again, two groups, one group with the Aegis goes one side, one group with the Taken Eye of Riven goes the other side. The person with the laser can go in anywhere they want. But just be ready to be able to read symbols if you need to. So again, do that. You'll have to then find the, the Taken guy with the shield. He'll be, again, on this infographic. I'll show you where he's at. He's gonna be in the middle. There's gonna be a ton of snipers. You'll have to watch out for that. You also need to make sure that, again, you're very cognizant of where Especially, I would say in this room, the most important thing is the person that has the Eye of Riven because this room is huge and the timing is very tight. So it's very important to be constantly moving. I would say once you take a Blight out, unless for some reason you, you're stuck and have to read for someone, go ahead and immediately head over to the other side because it's such a big room, you have to be constantly on the room even more than the person with the Aegis. Continue to do that. You know, kill that guy, uh, the Taken uh, that has a shield get your second set of symbols, shoot the symbols in the door, you're done, 
Again, watch for the scree, put your relics in, you're done. Again, very complex encounter, requires everyone to do a job. You can't just sit back and clear ads. So this is where a lot of people get stuck. So if you made it this far, you've made it to the boss encounter for the Vowed Disciple Raid. Now, there is a lot going on with this particular encounter. I will say now that it's not in contest mode, I actually find that this encounter, especially once you get practice with it, is probably one of the easier boss encounters. But it does require some practice. The good news is everything you've done in the raid up until this point will dovetail perfectly in helping you understand what you need to do to complete this encounter. First off, you'll enter the main room, and it's an incredible looking room. I, to be honest with you, some of the, just the visuals and the sound that Bungie's put together for this raid are just incredible. It's almost, especially the boss room, this looks like nothing you'd seen in a Destiny raid. But let's get into details. So first off, when you get in the room, you'll notice the boss that's sitting up there in the middle. And you'll also notice that there are, that's a crystal above him. We'll get to more of that in a second. There's also a middle plate that you can stand on the light up. One other thing you'll notice in the room is that you'll notice that there are totems on the left and right. The way we enable this, and you can do this the way you want to, is we did L1 through 3 on left, R1 through 3 on right, with one being closer to where you entered in the room. So L1, L2, L3, then R1, R2, and R3. This will become very important because you have to interact with these later on in the encounter. You'll also notice there's a boss shield that's over the encounter. When you touch that, that's when you start the encounter. So don't do that until you're ready. Once you start the encounter, you're going to notice that the boss is going to shoot out lasers, which will become very important later on in this encounter. And you'll also notice over time there's going to be a lot of ads and there'll be glyph keepers just as there were in previous portions of these encounters. Now let's talk about mechanics. So in the middle, you'll notice it's a crystal. You'll shoot that and that'll give one person leeching force, which gives you, I think, a 45 second uh, timer on it. Once that timer runs out, you'll die. But there's a reason you're picking that up. That is going to allow you when you step into in front of one of the laters to get in something called emanating force. That emanating force is what's gonna allow you to interact with the different totems this encounter. Now, having only one person with either leeching and emanating force is obviously an issue because only that one person will be able to do that portion of the encounter. But you, what you can do instead is you can get on that center plate, let's say you have leeching force. What that'll do is that'll present two crystals, one on the right and one left. The people shoot that, shoot those, and then with that, the leeching force goes away from the primary person, the person at first, to the other two people. So that gives you more people that have leeching force that can interact with the totems. Now, while that laser is really good for the people with leeching force because it gives an emanating force, if you're not one of those people, you don't want to have that thing hit you. It will not kill you immediately. It will, however, give you a lot of pervading darkness, which if you get hit multiple times, can kill you. So just try to stay, you try to use cover. There's a lot of cover in this encounter. Try to use cover to stay away from that. And you'll see him. He, he's very, he's on the right and left. He moves. It takes a while before he shoots his laser. So just keep that in mind, keep in cover when you have the opportunity. So once this is done, the other mechanic is that you're going to want to take down Glyph Keepers. Now, just like with other portions of this raid, you need to kill a bunch of ads to take the Glyph Keepers. So Keep that in mind, taking up Glyph Keepers is what you're going to need to open up and look at the glyphs that you need to use. There'll be one on the right and one on the left. Once you do that, the person with the buff, so the people with the buffs and the people without the buffs will be able to see different symbols. For one portion of the team, it'll be on the right. For the other portion, it'll be on the left. You read those out and figure out which one's common. On the totems, there will be a total of two totems that have that on there. Now, you can, if you want to accelerate the encounter, you can have two people get emanating force, go forward, dunk that in and then advance the encounter that way but for if you want to be safe have one person who has emanating force go in dunk everything in and then that will basically start advancing the encounter some more now let's talk about roles roles are pretty simple in this encounter you're going to have probably three people who are kind of exchanging the leeching force back and forth and getting the emanating force and then you have three people in ad clear the good news is ad clear when you're not in contest mode is pretty easy in this encounter there's a lot of cover. So as long as you're careful and use the right build, you should be fine. Now let's talk about the flow of the encounter. So first off, obviously you've started it off, you've shot the crystal, you've gotten you've gotten leeching force at that point, and you're trying to get emanating force. You're gonna wanna kill adds. Those, killing those adds spawn glyph keepers. Glyph keepers reveal the symbols. Emanating force people deposit their buff, stuff we've already talked about already. And then obviously you're gonna wanna continue to have people who have the leeching buff to continue to exchange that to other people so you keep that going once you deposit 
I look at it as deposit at the totems because it's similar to what you do in the garden at Salvation or you're doing Gambit and things like that. The motion is the same. After a few of those dunks, then the shield's going to move up and you're going to have an abomination that shows up in the middle. So take that out and again, continue to progress this. When you get a total of six of those, you're going to advance the boss phase. So once you get to the boss encounter, obviously Rolk, Rolk, I don't know how to pronounce that name, but once you get to the, ba the boss encounter, this is like no boss encounter I've ever seen in Destiny. So let's first talk about some of the basic mechanics. As below, the boss will shoot out lasers, again as normal. It'll be in a cross pattern, so it's very easy as he's moving around. If you pay attention to him and you're in a diagonal from him, it's very easy then to not get hit by the laser. So where you can, try to avoid that. The boss is very mobile. He can kick you off the encounter and he does a lot of damage with his glaive if it gets close to you. So again, your head's gonna be on a constant swivel. This is not a boss encounter where you're gonna be able to stay in one place and do DPS. I mean, you can, but he's gonna warp around a lot. So being mobile and being comfortably mobile is very important. To get leeching force, just like at the bottom, he has a glaive. If you shoot that glaive, the person who shoots it is going to get leeching force. Again, very important because you get leeching force, then you get shot his laser, you get emanating force. People without the buff, the emanating force, are going to be able to see the symbols and where to deposit things. So there's four uh, corners. If you think about it, you can think about it like, you know, like almost like your controller, right? You can take R1, R2, L2, L1, right? You can think about it that way. But it'll tell you where to dunk. So basically you get your leeching force, you get your emanating force, you figure out where you're supposed to dunk it, you dunk it. Once you dunk it, a crit spot will appear on the boss. One thing to keep in mind with the boss and shooting the crit spot, if you happen to hit the glaive, you can get leeching force. So just pay attention to your HUD because you're not paying attention, you get that. Then obviously at that point, you're gonna have to do that roll. Um, but that's one thing to keep in mind. Finish off for the crit spot. So you're gonna do that four times and that's when DPS starts. DPS, I think was confusing for some people on my team. The easiest way is the music will change. That's the easiest way to know that he's ready for DPS. He'll also stand in one place and be mobile, but as soon as you hear the music change, you know he's damageable. So finishing the boss encounter, since the boss is very mobile, Divinity will help, but not standing in one place will. So as long as the person with Divinity can be mobile and kind of feather it, I think you'll be fine. But we found this, this actually helped out a ton because it's very hard to hit his crit spot otherwise. He has a total of three total DPS phases, including an enrage mechanic. So you're gonna be able to have to burn him down. Now, he's not like Gatekeeper where he's gated. You can do as much damage as you want. It's just timed, so keep that in mind. Once you complete one phase, you have to go back down the stairs and do the first part again. At the very end, if you get his DPS down to that very last sliver, right? You see that little, on his bar, there's a little last sliver like most, there'll be a last stand. At that point, it'll begin putting Pervading Darkness on you. When it gets to 10, your entire team, fire team wipes. So that's where it's really good during that last phase to save any supers, or any heavy weapons or things for that, so you don't wipe as you put all this effort into finishing the raid. As far as weapon and super recommendations, you, you would balance add clear at the bottom with boss DPS. So Divinity's gonna work really well. Sleepers, rockets, and then highest DPS supers such as Tether, Nova, Thunder Crash are things you're gonna use. But again, use things you're comfortable with. And it's fine if a few people, if, if you're struggling with add clear, need a super, need specific weapons for add clear, that's fine. But again, just keep that in mind that you're gonna to wanna to have something that's probably really good heavy, and then you're gonna have a backup if you run out of ammo. But I will say, this versus a caretaker encounter, ammo consumption is fine. When, since you're killing a ton of adds at the bottom, you should have a ton of ability to pick up additional heavy. You should be fine. So again, guys, really fun encounter. After going through this entire slog of a raid, I love the raid. This encounter is a lot of fun. There's a lot of activity. I will say, compared to some of the other activities, once it was out of contest mode, this one is actually fairly simple. Because if when you're doing when you're clearing ads and things like that, you're actually it's very hard to die unless you're just not paying attention, right? So it's very easy for even the casual team to kind of go through this. But then the DPS phase, as long as you're comfortable with watching the boss constantly, making sure you know where he's at and moving accordingly, because you can kind of predict where he's gonna go. If you're doing that, you should be fine. And the DPS, to be honest with you, he was less tanky than the caretaker was. So again, going through this entire raid and getting to this encounter, it's a fun encounter, but if you've done all the other encounters, this will actually be one of the easiest encounters in the raid. That's the video, guys. If you like it, feel free to like it, subscribe to my channel, jump my Discord, and I'll see you, Guardians in the Tower.